Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're talking about how we talk about time. But first, we have very exciting news for 2018, which is twice the number of full episodes of Lingthusiasm every month. So up to this stage, we've been doing Patreon bonus episodes, which are sometimes a little bit shorter. One of them is a text chat episode, um, and sometimes they're they're cut bits from the show. Now we actually have enough support on Patreon to do full-length bonus episodes, so that means two Lingthusiasm episodes a month for people who support us on Patreon. We are really excited to have grown this far in this short amount of time. We'll still have free episodes every month through the main channel, but we'll also have another full-length episode, which means you get more bang for your Patreon buck. Yeah. So thanks to everyone who has brought us there so far, and it is not too late to start listening to these and all the previous Patreon episodes as well. We also released Lingthusiasm merch last month. IPA scarves, t-shirts and mugs and bags that say not judging your grammar, just analyzing it, and Lingthusiasm stickers. And they have been very popular. We have been very much enjoying seeing people's photos of them and stories about uh, who they got them for. So feel free to keep sending us those. Uh, We're excited to see what you end up doing with them. We were so excited when we put this, uh, especially with the scarves and the not judging your grammar uh, gear. We were so excited when we were putting this together, and it's been so nice to actually be able to share it with everyone and everyone else also getting really excited about it. And we're really excited to see some of that gear and some of our listeners at the Linguistic Society of America annual meeting in a few weeks in January. So we'll hopefully see some of you there. Our current Patreon episode to round out the gear is a question and answer session that we did at our Montreal live show. So if you want to know what it's like to have the opportunity to ask us some questions, if you want to uh, relive the live show experience, that is available on the Patreon now. It had a really good energy. People asked really good questions. And it was really fun to have that kind of more back and forth than we normally get to do in the episodes. So you can check that out and all the previous episodes. There's a quote that circulates around on the internet, one of those ones where the original author is lost to time, that for me sums up, I think, a lot of what we're going to cover in the episode today, uh, which is, you are a ghost driving a meat-coated skeleton made from stardust. Hmm. That is both weird and cool. (laughs) And I really like this quote because, uh, for me, it takes... Something that we take for granted, so our lived experience of how we move through the world, and it kind of just unhinges that for a second and makes you reflect on how really weird human bodies and human social interaction is. And I feel like a lot when I teach linguistics classes, a lot of my class is just me going, look at this really obvious thing you've done your whole life. Think about how weird it is for a moment. Think about how weird it is that we actually communicate with each other functionally. And I think a lot of the times when we're talking about linguistics, we end up talking about kind of the the meat suit part um, of like, this is what your tongue is doing. Just just think for a second about the fact that you have a tongue. It's pretty weird. Or this is what your, you know, vocal cords are doing or the weird flaps of skin in the rest of your throat are doing or the, you know, neurons that you can't see. And there's there's a lot of physical aspects to language that says, okay, well, spoken languages tend to have certain kinds of similarities because that's just how the human vocal tract is designed. Um, or sign languages have other certain kinds of similarities because that's what your hands can do. Like there aren't any sign languages that require you to like stand on your hands. <laughs> um, or that require you to, or like spoken languages that require you to like bite your tongue to make the word because humans don't want to do that. And I think the part that we often miss is that in addition to being in meat coated skeletons, we're also on a planet and we're on the same planet. And some of our experiences as speakers of any of the languages on this planet have certain kinds of similarities with each other because of that planet. And a lot of those are related to time. And so that is our topic for today. We're going to talk about talking about and thinking about how time works. So happy New Year's, Earthlings. We're going to talk about time. <laughs> it is, we are being a bit end of year, just after first anniversary reflective here, but uh, we, we think it's relevant all year round. Yeah. And, you know, one of the big things is that we're on a, we're on a big ball of rocks and water and 
we have this sun in the sky, and so languages have words for day and night and mark the passage of time with days and with years because those are things that all different human societies have observed. And we have a moon, which gives us things like months, and there are roughly 12 of them in a year. So 12 is often this important number for, for different measurements of time. I didn't really think about how important 12 was for time until we started listing places where it crops up. So it crops up, obviously, uh, we talk about 12-hour cycles in the day, and we have 24 hours, so that's two sets of 12 there. Uh, we have things like 12 signs of the zodiac or 12, 12 months in a given year. And we also have other types of time-related things that are divided up into 12s, like the the minutes and the hours on a clock get divided. In, so an hour gets divided into 60 parts, which is a uh, you know divisible by 12, and then a minute gets divided into 60 parts. And so I looked up because I was thinking, you know, why is it that a second is called uh, the same as, you know, the first, second, third, fourth. And that's not actually... <laughs> is, it, is it a coincidence? I had always assumed it was kind of... No, no, it's not a coincidence. I kind of vaguely assumed it was a coincidence. But actually, in medieval Latin, this is according to Ethim Online, which is great, they divided the hours into various kinds of small parts. And the first part of the hour was called the pars minuta prima, or the first small part. Um, and minuta there is related to like minute or miniature. Right. Yeah. But it just means small. And so that's where minute comes from. And that's the first small part. And then the pars minuta sec secunda. Ah, I see where this is going. It's the second small part. And that's the second. Right. Which is another 60th. And there actually used to be a term for a 60th of a second. Right. What we would now use a millisecond for, which was called a, a tierce or a third, which is the third small part, which is yet another 60th of a second. Oh, that, like, seconds are so simple and salient to me, having grown up with them, that a, a tierce, like a, a, a third, just sounds so weird, but a millisecond is completely fine. You can see the modern yeah. decimal system of influence. Modern decimal system kind of encroaching on the second. Yeah. yeah. Wow, imagine if we still measured things in thir thirds? <laughs> thirds. Thirds. Or, or tierces, if you want to be Latin tierces. about it. yeah. And, uh, but I mean, we could have ended up, you know, we had milliseconds now. The French Revolution, when they, which was one of the things that introduced the metric system, also tried to introduce a 10-day week instead of a 7-day week. Oh, uh, yeah, I heard about this. There's a great <laughs> Twitter account that just tweets out whatever day it is in the old French Revolutionary <laughs> calendar. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, and they named them all after, like, agrarian things, right? Yeah. So, like, there have been have been attempts to do that, but for some reason, like, the, se the seven-day week, and uh, I guess the nice thing is, is that if you divide a 28-day month, which is kind of a, a lunar month, into four parts, you get this seven-day week, even though there's no other reason to use seven because it's this weird prime number. And a 10-day week, it's a long time to the weekend. But if you have a three-day weekend, maybe. Like, you're never going to win people over. <laughs> I would rather get a two-day weekend after five days than a three-day weekend after seven. I don't remember exactly how they gave the days off. Maybe they had one halfway through, so it would be like three and then one and then three and then... How do you do math? What's, what's left? Two more? I'm not a French revolutionary. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll we'll have a link in the show notes page. So there's there's all these different ways of of kind of slicing and dicing time, and yet we've also ended up with this you know very weird calendar system that has all of these artifacts in it, like the fact that September, which has sept in it, which means seven, is actually not the seventh month; it's the ninth month. Uh, and October, which has oct meaning eighth, and it is actually the tenth month, and so on and so forth, because January and February didn't really used to be a thing. And so if you started counting at March, they work out. But like, yeah, there's there's lots of weird things about kind of weird artifacts that get snuck into our, our time counting systems. The other really cool thing about time. So um, this is a study about children called Learning the Language of Time, Children's Acquisition of Duration Words. Right. And it's by Catherine Tillman and David Barner. And they noticed, um, or people have noticed, that ch kids start using time-related words around the age of two or three, even though they have no idea how clocks work for, like, several more years. I would say definitely several more years, yeah. Until, like, eight or nine. Yeah. So what do they mean if they're saying the word minute or if they're saying the word hour if they don't actually know what a clock means? Right. 
And so they got a, a dozens of three and six year olds in the lab and they asked them to compare several different pairs of durations. So their example was Farmer Brown jumped for a minute, Captain Blue jumped for an hour. Who jumped more? Uh huh. And they also used seconds, days, weeks, months, and years. And by age four, the children tended to get more of these questions right than you'd expect if they just guessing. And as they got older, they got better and better at that. So they know an hour is longer. They may not be able to tell you exactly how long. Yeah. Hmm. But then they asked them things like, Farmer Brown jumped for three minutes. Captain Blue jumped for two hours. Who jumped more? And adults are like, yeah, this, this is still really obvious. And the kids were like, I don't, I don't know. Wow. Stump them. That's so, uh, yeah, as an adult, you're like, this is so painfully obvious. How can you not get this? <laughs> like, why are you asking me this? But this is why you, you, this is why we have science, right? So you're not just like, this is so obvious. But yeah, so kids get thrown by this. Well, it's three minutes, but it's two hours. Like, what, mm. what, what are you going to do? Whereas, you know, we know that an hour is an order of magnitude larger than a minute. It doesn't matter if you just add one. Yeah. And, Kids also do this types of things for numbers and colors. They have these kinds of, you know, general concepts of them before they have a very good idea of the specific details. So a kid might be able to use a word like hundred or thousand, probably. This is me inferring from their study. It without actually counting all of them, but just just they just see a lot of cookies and be like, wow, there's a hundred cookies. And there's actually like 20. But they have the sense that a hundred is a lot. I'd still be happy with 20 cookies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so would I. But you know, counting is a thing. Yeah. And so we have the kind of general semantics. And it's that thing, like, we do it as adult speakers as well, right? Like, we say, you know, I'll, oft I'll often message you and be like, I'll be online in two minutes. And you can expect me anytime within the next one to 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you're 10 minutes there, I'm not like, oh, you're eight minutes behind. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was kind of in the order of magnitude. Right. I've, I've started the stopwatch. Especially if you think about how parents or adults talk about time to kids. It's like, yes, 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 I promise we're, we're going to have, you know, we're going to go in, in, in a minute. And then like 20 minutes later, the parent's like, I guess we're going now. Yeah, it is very confusing to learn to navigate this. Yeah, you, you, can, watch, you can watch TV in a minute and it's actually like, you know, or like in an hour and it's actually three hours or it's actually half an hour. And I think parents know that kids don't really understand those, those times. Uh, and they're, they're often not very precise about them with kids because it's just easier to give a, give a general impression. But I think the classic way that I remember counting time when I was a kid was with sleeps. So you would say things like, you know, three more sleeps until we're going to go visit your grandparents. And that was three more days, but somehow it was easier to count sleeps. I think there are only like, Four or five sleeps until Christmas when this episode comes out. There you go. Depending which time zone you're in. Depending on when you listen to it. Maybe they're listening to it like a year from now. You can only listen to this episode on any given 21st of December. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's like three more sleeps. Uh, French also has this word, but they don't use the normal word for sleep. They use a, like a baby talk word, which is dodo. So you can say like toi dodo. Uh, and that means like three more sleeps because you're using like the baby talk register. That's cute. I mean, I guess sleep, a, a, a sleep is a weird, like I think I only yeah. use it with children. So yeah. Use sleep as a noun. I mean, I think you can say like I, I slept the sleep of the of the just or something if you want to be more formal. Yeah, but not to a three-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing I've always found really hard to get my head around with time is that different cultures obviously have different times that they celebrate the new year. The, the concept of a new year and counting years is completely arbitrary. And um, in Nepal, there are about five different uh, ethnic groups that have five different dates that they measure new years on. And uh, oh, that's exciting. It's always so amazing. It's like this thing that you think is this really important thing and then you discover that other people, for other people, your new year means nothing and they've got their own thing going on. Yeah. And like, it's, it's interesting how the year itself is so universal, but the, the time when you, when you pick it is so arbitrary. Whereas something like a day, like we all have the same kinds of dawns and sunsets because that's built in. But for a new year, sometimes people go for a solstice or an equinox. Sometimes people go for like a lunar calendar where the years don't actually quite match up because you're, you're caring more about the months. You know, there's like lots of different types of, types of years. There's also a lot of cultural variation in how people conceptualize where they are in time and how time happens. Um, and this is 
more or less a really elaborate culture-wide metaphor that different cultures can have. Um, so when you hear metaphor, you might think of like um, school comprehension classes where you learned that like, you know, the sun is a big yellow balloon is a metaphor and the sun is like a big yellow balloon is a simile and both of them are equating something with another property. And that is true and you can use them as a very specific literary device. And in those cases, like the more novel, the better. Uh, but we also have these metaphors that are really pervasive um, in how we see the world and our place in them. And they're so ingrained that you don't even think about them as metaphors. They're just how things are. No, so we really have to think about ourselves as souls in meat-covered skeletons on a ball of rocks hurtling through space. And this kind of area of semantic, it's really a kind of a property of semantics and cognitive linguistics, is probably best encapsulated or kind of kicked off through our work by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. So a lot of the work in this area uh, is inspired by them and their book, Metaphors We Live By, because they're so pervasive. So, for example, we have a lot of things like, you know, last year is behind us. Uh, we can move forward. I can't wait until Christmas. Uh, like, Christmas is coming up really quickly. Are all so so time can time can move quickly in a way that's kind of weird. I think even just saying like, oh, I'm looking forward to when we're going to do this. That's like like the future is ahead of us. The past is behind us. Or like, let's just put that behind us. Meaning, let's just forget about it. Yeah. So we have an orientation where like the future is ahead and the past is behind us. And so we have two slightly different ways of thinking about this in English. We can say like, I just have to get to September and then I can go on holiday. And so we're moving through space towards September or the future or whatever's happening. And then mm, okay. we but we have a slightly different one where like Christmas has come up so quickly. Um where t where we're kind of stationary and time is flowing past us. But what's common to both of those is the future. Like I can't believe we've arrived at December already. Yeah. Hmm. But future pretty safely anchored in front of us. Whereas there are other cultures and the most famous one is Aymara, which is an Aymaran language of South America. So with Aymara, the future is behind us and the past is in front of us. And if you think about it, it makes a kind of sense because uh, we know what happened in the past. You know, I know what happened to me yesterday. I am not psychic and I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. So it makes mm. sense that the future is in the part of your vision where you can't see and you don't know what's there, but you can look out over your life and where you've come from um, as you've traveled through. So it actually, like, it's a really robust logic and it's totally the opposite metaphor, but it's encoded in their language the way our way of talking about time is encoded. Um, another common one that's often talked about is uh, especially uh, in various Chinese languages where you have a vertical orientation of time. Hmm. where the past is above and the future is below. And that's partly the, the writing system that motivates that. And we have, even though it's not in our speech, we often see in our gesture, not only do we have this forward-backward space orientation, but we have a left-to-right hmm. orientation. So if you think about plotting out everything you have to do in the next couple of days on a timeline – then you're more likely to put events earlier on the left and events later on the right. Right. So like, okay, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that. Sometimes we have these metaphors that are so deep in our consciousness, they don't even show up in our speech, but they show up in the way that we orient ourselves. But if we were using a, a right to left writing system like Arabic or Hebrew, we would probably p plot out things on a timeline in the other direction. Yeah, there's been like so little research that's really nailed a lot of this down. Lira Boroditsky... Um, is a cognitive psychologist who's done some work on Chinese and English um, monolinguals and bilinguals. And she's found mm. that especially with the um, with Mandarin speakers, you can get them thinking vertically or horizontally depending on how you prime them before you do the experiment, which is cool. So there's both long-term, like it's very hard for us to think about time you know, forward and backward, but you can also prime people to think about these metaphors in more short-term ways as well. And like, and people often use, you know, like even just an arrow going from left to right to indicate things about the future. Yeah. So um, Hillary Clinton's 2016 election campaign logo, which was very unpopular at the time. And I wrote, I wrote about it and what the arrow was doing in the H as it pointed 
to the right. And also FedEx has that little oh, yeah. optical like illusion arrow. arrow in the logo. And if you look at it, they would never have done that logo if the the writing was such that it went from right to left because that wouldn't be indicating kind of future dynamic forwardness. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of like – so email programs do this, right? If you have like the reply arrow has this kind of circle back pointing to the left and the forward arrow has it going towards the the right. And those are just arrows like the, your your email contacts don't exist outside of time like in time and space but they're they're using those arrows to kind of transmit those ideas. Yeah. So these metaphors are, are really pervasive in how we talk and think about time. So FedEx doesn't want to make you think that they're going to like run off with your package and take it back to the, <laughs> the factory. Uh, F- FedEx your package just comes back to you every time. <laughs> and that's what would happen if they use the arrow in the other direction. Um yeah, that would be that would be a not good and you know it's it's a, a i've also written some stuff about emoji direction so they're oriented so that they make sense in terms of japanese word order mm. but in terms of english word order it makes it look like people aren't moving forward from left to right and so they're not moving forward in time and english speakers get really irritated by that so the the vehicles and the people walking all point from right to left and we interpret that as like they're going backwards. Oh, okay. Whereas if you spoke Japanese, because that language is subject, object, verb, and then that, then you want to put the verb at the end of the sentence so that you can be like, yeah, this refers back to the thing that was at the beginning. Yeah. So in that language, it's pointing the right way. But for English speakers, it doesn't gel with our sense of things moving forward. And so I love this way because you really, you know, time is so hard to get our hands on that we have to use whatever strategy we can. And these metaphors are a really nice way to do that but we really take them for granted sometimes you're just like oh wow yeah that's how we that's how we move through the world yeah another thing that i take for granted a lot is that you know time is this abstract concept but for some of us and and i'm one of them uh there we actually have this kind of intuitive way of visualizing time so there's a phenomenon known as synesthesia which is uh when you have you know, kind of cross-sensory perception. So the classic example of synesthesia is grapheme color synesthesia, which means a certain letters or numbers uh, have particular colors associated with them. And I have that as well, and we'll probably talk about that in some other episode. But in this particular context, I want to talk about time-space synesthesia a little bit, because this is actually one of these kind of it's less talked about and it's a lot more common, I think, than people were realizing that a lot of people have instinctive visual metaphors, a kind of a mental image or an image in your mind's eye of where different times of day are, where different days of the week are, where different months of the year are, hours in the day. So, hmm. Yeah, I definitely haven't heard of that as much as I've heard yeah. of uh, color letter grapheme synesthesia. Yeah, the grapheme one, I mean, it's it's easier to visualize because you can just put the stuff in different colors. Whereas the, <laughs> you know, I think I've I've looked at you know, some of the diagrams that come with the studies and I'm like, that looks really weird. But also I know I have this thing. Mine just looks different from that. So the classic example that you generally see in time-space synesthesia studies is, so most, I think most time-space synesthetes visualize time as a circle, which kind of makes sense because okay. all of our time thing is like hours in the day, um, you know, months of the year, they repeat and they're cyclic around each other. Yeah. And, uh, and the the classic one that you see in the visualizations is that someone will will be standing in the center of this big kind of ring, and in the ring are the different months of the year in order, and the one that's in front of the person will be the current month. So let's say you're looking at uh, December and you're like, this is the month that we're in right now, and then beside it will be January because you're flipping over to the next year, and you'll just keep going around, and it'll kind of move in front of you as time progresses. Um, right. And some people have it in kind of like a, a bit of an elliptical shape. Like it's not just generally a perfect circle. It's not like a hula hoop. Um, huh. It's this kind of elliptical shape. And sometimes it's tilted a bit. Um, sometimes there are colors involved. This is this kind of, yeah, thing that people have. For me, I have it as a loop, but I have it as a up-down loop that circles around in the back. Um, so okay. rather than like the hula hoop so thing. So you're not standing in the middle of it. I'm not standing in the middle of it. I'm looking at it. It's kind of like um, if I was going to take my watch off and hold it in front of me so I could see the face of it, then that would loop behind itself as well. Okay. Except it's bigger than that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and it doesn't have a watch on it. It doesn't have a clock face on it. <laughs> and I have the same mental loop for both hours of the day 
and months of the year. So midnight is where January is. Okay. Um, and it goes, you know, it goes through, and noon is around where, like, June is. And it, like, goes through, like, midnight Midnight in January are at the top, and then it kind of loops loops in the back very quickly, and it just kind of goes around there. So I was... <laughs> I was trying to look for this this visualization that I'd seen before of the months around the person. Um, and I ended up on this article uh, that uh, was trying to describe this. And it was saying that, you know, oh, people have time, space, synesthesia. They're like time lords. And they have all these things. And I just, you know, don't have magical powers here, people. <laughs> Do you do you use it mentally when if you're like, okay, I have to do this thing in September, so I have four months to do it like is yeah i mean i use it in like i i I do i do use it to kind of keep track of where i am going about my day or like knowing when something is or like how how soon is that how far is that like this feels far away or this feels close by uh i use it for that and i i did notice so i was in hawaii in uh march this year and i left montreal in the cold and then hawaii has this beautiful balmy temperatures obviously and I noticed that I was in the wrong spot in my mental calendar, and I felt like I was in July because that's what the weather was like, right. even though I was in March. So I had a really hard time calculating times for like several weeks afterwards because I just my body had decided that I was in July now. Like my brain somehow decided that I was in <laughs> July now, and I was really not. It's kind of like a macro version of you know that thing where you have this sense that it's Tuesday, but it's actually Thursday. Yep. And you don't know why it feels like a Tuesday, but it feels like a Tuesday, and there's a way that Tuesday that feels. That for a year. I, I had that for, like, several months because oh. I got really thrown off. How disconcerting. It was pretty bad. <laughs> now that it's getting cold here again, it's it's better. I'm like, it's definitely winter now. <laughs> but it really messed me up, yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, it's like, but I'm, you know, I'm not a time lord. My apartment is not bigger on the inside. How disappointing. I know. I, I tried, but <laughs> they don't sell TARDIS apartments. <laughs> Be very convenient. Yeah. Do you find that you assume other people are kind of visualizing time in this way as well, or do you find that it clashes with those other cultural metaphors about time? Um, I just I kind of take it for granted. Like I don't really think about it very often. It's mm-hmm. just there. It's kind of like you don't think about how you know what your mother looks like. You just know or. You know, like you don't you don't think about the fact that you're a meat puppet skeleton. <laughs> you don't think about the fact that you're a meat puppet in space. Sometimes I do see uh, calendars that, for some inexplicable reason, will put their earlier times at the bottom. So there's this cal- this website that I've been visiting a lot lately, which tells you when the sunset and sunrise times are for your location. Because I'm really yep. counting down the days to when we can start moving out of this darkness, <laughs> and I'd like my sun to start rising again at like earlier than four o'clock. And for some inexplicable reason, this this sunset website, it starts, it's, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. at the bottom, and it's evening at the top. That is very confusing. And that just throws me every single time, and I don't know why they're doing it. But yeah, that that really messes me up. But I think that would mess most people up, because... That would definitely mess me up. You know, if you're using an agenda or something, all of our metaphors are that the, like, later in the day is at at the bottom. Yeah. So I don't know what these people are. Maybe they have synesthesia and that's how their synesthesia works. And they're like, finally, I can make this thing the way I like it. (laughs) That's my best guess. But I think one of the things when I think about, you know, being a, you know, ghost in a meat suit, meat skeleton, is that there's a certain amount of similarity that linguistics has to another hobby that I've been taking up in the recent couple of years, which is stargazing. Yeah. And before I started stargazing, you know, I would go outside at night and I would look up at the stars and be like, wow, there's stars. That's nice. Yeah, they're there. <laughs> they're there. Look, pretty. Sometimes there's a moon. And, you know, I knew one or two constellations, but if I couldn't find those, you know, if Orion wasn't up, then I was just like, oh, there's stars. And now that I've been stargazing for over a year and I know how what most of the constellations are and how they move through the sky at different hours of the day and different times of the year, and I have names associated with them, I go outside and I look at the same sky and what I see there is different because all of the individual pieces have have a meaning now and have, you know, associations with them and have patterns that I can see. And obviously the sky hasn't changed. I've changed. But in many cases, like language is kind of like all those stars. We're surrounded by it all the time. You you hear it all the time. You see it. It's there. 
But being able to look at language like a linguist looks at language is now you have words and you have frameworks that you can put in. Here's what all these sounds are. And they're not just kind of a bath of sounds. They're, they're constellations. So you have this way of making sense of all of the stuff that you're seeing and you're experiencing it and putting it into some sort of context. I think for me, that's one of the things that's really magical about linguistics and stargazing. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can also get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include a live Q&A, the semantics of sandwiches, language games, and hypercorrection. And you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. If you can't afford to pledge, that is also okay. We really also appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their lives. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire and our editorial producer is Emily. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!